time to start. So uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Femi Chandra, um, who uh, needs no introduction, so I won't give her any. So I'll just begin. <laughs> okay, well, first of all, can everyone hear me? It seems to be an echo. I know. Okay. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be back in London among so many old friends and meeting new ones. And uh, today I'd like to uh, tell you about challenges and opportunities in quantum critical polar materials. I'm going to move this chair because I might trip over. Okay. So uh, I'd like to tell you about uh, challenges and opportunities in quantum critical polar metals. Today, I'll make a, have a pedagogical talk to introduce many of you to these materials and defend our challenges and opportunities. And then on Friday, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the questions that uh, my friends and I have been pursuing. And of course, please, okay, we've hit our first technical glitch. Why is this not moving? Hang on. All right. So, first of all, let me remind you what is a polar material. A polar material is one that has a net dipole for moment. But of course, that can't happen if it's centrosymmetric. However, if it's non centrosymmetric, it can. Here I have four minus plus 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 minus. No, I cannot have a polar material. But here I have non centrosymmetric and I can develop a polarization, which is the net dipole moment per volume. However, just because I break, uh, centri uh, just because I'm non -centri -centri symmetric or break inversion symmetry doesn't mean I'm polar. For example, quartz breaks inversion symmetry. It's not polar. I also have to have a polar axis. So a polar space, uh, a being polar is a subset of the breaking inversion. All right, and the poster child of polar materials is bearing tightening. I was taught to know bearing tightening when I worked in industry at the labs. Bearing tightening is the perovskite. In its cubic phase, it looks like this. Okay, uh, it goes from cubic to tetragonal, and when it does, the titanium moves either up or down, and you break inversion symmetry. And uh, we have a polarization that's either up or down. And again, very tightening is the poster child of polar materials. It was studied a lot, as we'll, as we'll discuss, many of these materials have been studied for their applications. Very tightening was a strong contender for memories. That's why at the labs, they had a lot of very good crystals of very tightening. It was beaten out by magnetic memories. But at one point, the notion was that we store information in the up and down states, and it was studied a lot. It turned out that its surface states were some of the reasons why it wasn't used. But as a result, people at Bell did study surface states, and that ended up being very important for some of their research in semiconductors. Okay. So, that's one of my first projects when I was a summer student in Virginia Bell. Was actually to do a measurement on one of the famous old ferrum type crystals. Yes, I had to do experiments. I have a huge respect for experiments. And they had all these wonderful old crystals around. And so they used to give some students and to tell students to measure because they no longer believe that they would be good for functional purposes. So that's how I learned about ferrum type. All right. So as I alluded to, the simplest polar materials are ferroelectric. Now, the irony of ferroelectrics is most ferroelectrics don't have iron, but they're called ferroelectrics, of course, because of the analogy with ferromagnetism. So a ferroelectric is a material that has a spontaneous polarization that's switchable by an electric field of practical magnitude. Okay, so we have a separation of minus and plus charges. Okay, we have an electric field that can switch it. And just like a ferromagnet, you have a hit, you can have hysteresis loops. Here we have P versus E. And we have materials, we have ferroelectric, ferroelectric materials that can be switched. 
and they can be used, for example, for memory devices. Then pyroelectrics, okay? Pyroelectrics is in pyroelectrics, which are used for heat sensors, you apply a voltage, you apply a temperature gradient, and you get a voltage. For piezoelectrics, uh, you can uh, have if you, all the micro machines are made from piezoelectrics or transducers. You can uh, you can convert mechanical energy into electrical energy, and of course dielectrics that are used to enhance capacitors. So, not surprisingly, as you can guess, these polar materials have been for the most part studied for their room temperature application. Thermoelectrics are used for the high conductivity. They're used DRAM storage capacitors. Uh, a lot of pyroelectrics are used in infrared switches, heat sensors, piezoelectric, piezo, uh, piezoelectric systems are used in transducers, converting mechanical to electrical energy. In your cars, you have a lot of them. Okay, they're great. Uh, one of the big quests, particularly in Europe, is to find a good piezoelectric, uh, good piezoelectrics that are lead free. Okay. Um, so these materials are have been studied a lot for the room temperature application, and I became aware of them through my work in industry before I was a director. I was in industry at Bell, at Exxon, and then at NEC, and I learned about them through my work in industry. But one of the questions when I came to Rutgers to academia, I asked was, okay, I learned about these materials and I learned about their applications, but these are materials that have been really well studied. Can these functional materials teach us anything about basic, about some fundamental physics in nature? Okay. <laughs> so I went back into the literature and found out that actually they already had. And so today, my plan is to tell you a little bit about what's been done in these materials. And my feeling is in a pedagogical lecture, I hope to tell you something that you might not just get in a regular textbook. You can all read that by yourselves. So you don't need me. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about what I found. First of all, I found that ferroelectrics play a really important role in classical critical phenomena. And it's interesting because particularly we're in London, which is where a lot of very important work in critical phenomena happens. I've just been reading Cyrus Cyril Dong's book on the critical point, all about the history of critical phenomena based in London. And I have to say that they don't give a lot of discussion about the Russian approach to critical phenomena. And this paper was really crucial. This is a paper by Larkin and Tunitsky. And in this paper, they looked at phase transitions in uniaxial ferrolite. Now, let me just set the stage. This is 1969. Okay. Now, remember, I say remember, you know, in the, in the broadest sense, collectively, remember that there was Landau theory, and then there was the Ising solution. Onslager came up with the Ising solution sometime in the late 40s, I think. Okay. So people became aware of it. In the early 50s. Okay. But the question was, how do we connect the two? People had realized, according to some, people had realized that when they did measurements, they were getting exponents that were not fitting with Linda. Then they knew from Anzarger's solution that there were exponents that were not uh, the Linda exponents. But the question is, how do you connect all this with experiment? All right. So one of the first things that Berlin and Koch did was they said, can we come up with a soluble model, in this case, the spherical model, that is in finite dimension that gives different exponents? So what they did, if you know the Ising model, don't know, for those of you who are students here, are you familiar with the spherical model? Okay, so let me tell you just a minute for what the spherical model is. You have the Ising model, and up, down. The spherical model does is they say, let's say that instead of up and down, we can have, uh, we, we can relax that criteria. However, we need that the sum of, instead of sigma i being plus and minus one, sigma i being the same, we can relax that criteria. However, if we sum 
all the sigma i's on all sites, that has to be n. Okay. So that's the spherical model. And what Hawk and Berlin found using method of sequence descent, which you may have learned, that was one of the first places to do, is they actually found that they got non-long Landau exponents for this model in one, two, and three dimensions. But in four dimensions and up, they were getting mean field Landau kind of exponents. Okay. And then uh, and then I think it was uh, Berlin and someone else who I'm sorry I've forgotten their name realized that this is the same model, the spherical model, the same thing as the ON model. You've heard a little bit about the ON model so far. Uh, the ON model is a model that's often consistent. Okay, so the ON model is an n vector model. Okay, so this was the first model that people could solve exactly. It wasn't necessarily that physical, but in lower dimensions, it had non mean field exponents. That's so the normalization of both of this is which is after this. Okay. Uh, the spherical model, to my knowledge, is in the late 50s. Okay. This is right after that. What's amazing is already with the spherical model, they knew that, and I'm not sure what communication was of it, uh, according to. Dima, who, as you know, is now in Cambridge, they didn't really know that much about what was going on with this. But anyway, um, what's fascinating is this is before Wilson. Okay? That's why this is so important. Okay? Because all of this was extremely abstract. Okay? And I, I really recommend um, Cyril Dom's book on the critical point. As many of you know, I started in history. I'm really interested in history with the ideas. Um, but I've been trying to get some of my Russian colleagues to write the Russian version of the Kosky Dixon or Dorothy Dixon work in the midst of, also of the Russian approach, because it's clear that there were some parallel streams. And certainly I, in my education, didn't learn about that. Okay, I had to figure it out for myself. So that's why I'm hoping to share some of this that I learned that you might not find in the usual textbook. Okay, so it turns out that a parallel can be described by an ON model. Right? We're going to get there in a minute. I'm just going to talk first. Could you comment on that? Sure. I'm going to get to formula in a minute. I'm just going to set the stage. Okay. I'm supposed to, I think this is on front of me. I'm going to show you. Okay. So it's described by the ON, ON model. What Larkin and Kaminitsky realized, what, if you have a uniaxial parallax, and I'll talk about that in a minute, that you actually are in D equals four dimensions. And it's clear it's in three dimensions, but the fact that you're uniaxial won't put you in four dimensions. They did the first calculation of logarithmic corrections to the field theory in the marginal dimension, and it was actually seen in the experiment. So let's go through that. First of all, the ferroelectric is well described by an ON spherical model. We just talked about what the spherical model is. It has an upper critical dimension of four, which means that interactions are relevant to be less than uh, four, and mean field exponents are relevant to be greater than four. Okay. The Larkin Kaminitsky argument was that in a uniaxial ferroelectric, uh, D, D, F, the effective dimension is the spatial dimension plus one. And so in this system, you have accessible corrections to land on theory in an experimental system. So before this time, there were exponents that were calculated. They were using Pade, should be Pade Kovaleska, Pade Kovaleska approximates low temperature expansion, high temperature expansion, but they had not been done exactly. The only exponents that had been done exactly were for the spherical model, the Gaussian model, and the Eigen model. Could you remind what these are from Schematics? They are impossible. Yeah, we're about to do that. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to, for the students, what happened? Sorry. 
uh, share screen. I'm about to do that. So let's just to respond to Andrew. A uniaxial paraelectric, let me show you the argument. The argument is the following. Let's say all the dipoles are in the Z direction. And in Fourier space, the dipole potential will go as QZ squared over Q squared. So when I write down, well, when I write down the action, okay, I'm in three dimensions here. I write down the action, okay, this is our order formula, and I have Q squared plus QZ squared over Q squared plus a gap. We're in the uniaxial paraelectric space. Now, I can do an application of simple scaling. First of all, I'm going to be interested in very small QZ because bipolar interactions are long range. So I'm going to assume that this Q squared is really QX squared plus QY squared, okay? You can throw out QZ squared. Now I can do simple scaling. I can say, let's take X dx, okay? My, my action should be invariant to that. So if I take X to dx, then Q perp goes to Q perp over B. But now I can say, well, what does QZ go to? But let's say QZ goes to QZ over B to some K. Either B and K are greater than one. So then if I apply that idea, here I have Q squared over B squared. Here I have Q squared over Q squared. Here I have B squared over B to K. And for this term and that term to be the same, I need 2 minus 2K equals minus 2, which means K equals 2. So what that tells me is that QZ, I don't know what to do with this thing. If you go to north, for those three dots. Yes. You go to where the height of floating less two dots. Oh, thank you. So uh, in this case, QZ counts for effectively two dimensions. So what that tells us then is that the uniaxial ferroelectric, instead of being three dimensional, is effectively four dimensional. So what that tells us is that, well, I say us, but this was originally Lucky Kalinowski, is that here we have a system that is actually effectively at its marginal dimension. So now, I remember this was before renormalization group was developed. So they had to do some pretty muscular calculations. So what they did then was they decided to calculate exactly critical exponents in four dimensions that can be measured in the laboratory. So they used what we call a parquet approximation, okay, which now we know is okay in the marginal dimension. And they decided to calculate specific heat because in Landau theory, the specific heat does not have a singularity. It only has a discontinuity. So what they did was they said, let's calculate the specific heat. It's a tour de force calculation. They calculated the critical logarithmic corrections. It looks like for n less than four. In our case, the uniaxial for electric, again, I'm using the collective we use collective hours, n equals one. And you see that the change in the specific heat is log of t zero over t to the one third. <coughs> and for those of you who are interested in this renormalization group, you notice that this n plus eight comes in. Uh, when Wilson looked at the Gaussian Hicks point, there are a lot of these n plus eights that show up. Okay. And this is before Wilson. Wilson's in the 70s. Okay. So this was going on, and they had a sense. I've asked Dima, what did they know about the marginal dimension? It's really incredible that this is going on completely in parallel. Now, what happened? So what they did was they did this calculation, and then, of course, the question is, can you measure this? On ferroelectrics, this is really tough to measure. Because remember, in ferroelectrics, the development of the polarization involves a soft fermion. Okay? Ferroelectrics are extremely lattice sensitive. And there is a Russian physicist called Shurkov who tried to measure this. And he did see logs, but he realized that those logs were due to all kinds of lattice imperfections. Okay? In ferroelectrics, you need to have incredibly good uh, 
sample in order to see this. But interesting enough, where it was seen was across the ocean at Bell Labs. Sarah Hohenberg, who was at Bell Labs, had spent some time in Moscow as a postdoc. And he knew about this, these measurements. He knew about this theory. It was also fluent in Russian. And Gunther Allert, who is someone who was actually one of my teachers when I was a graduate student, who uh, taught me better than that. But in any case, he, of course, is from the helium community. He measured critical X loading. Uh, Pierre Hollenberg and Kurt Halpern told him about this Russian paper. And there was a dipolar ising ferromagnet that they had at Bell, okay, lithium terbium chloride. And they said, why don't you try and do this measurement? And so he did. And in fact, in the dipolar ising ferromagnet, they actually saw, I'm not going to show the data because there's some subtraction issues and stuff like that. We don't want to spend the whole time on this, but they actually saw these results are in agreement with the predicted value of a half, a third, and a fourth, respectively. They calculated the amplitudes, they calculated the exponents that you see. Then in Japan, where they're very, very good at making wonderful materials, a couple of years later, in the 80s, they actually saw the same thing in parallel. But the reason that this was a very, very important calculation is it was really the first time in the sort of real material that people had calculated exactly um, the, um, the exponent. Okay, so, all right. And then what's interesting is the fact that, you know, the Russians said, in particular Rochester, what happens if we look at very low temperatures? So this was a paper, 1971, remember this is before Hertz, all of this, where people were saying, what happens if we look at a phase transition at very low temperatures? Well, Rochester wrote the first paper on this, and uh, as in a paramagnet, in a ferroelectric, as you approach the classical transition, you have uh, the, the dielectric susceptibility that goes with one over T. What Rochester asked is, suppose we had a zero transition, a quantum transition, okay? what would the susceptibility look like? And he did a quite a complicated calculation that showed that the inverse of chi went like t squared. Okay. And the story that Dima Kaminsky tells me is that he was a graduate student with Larkin, and Larkin told him and another student, what happens if you're away from the critical point? What does the susceptibility look like? Okay. So this was done purely as an academic exercise. People weren't really thinking about quantum phase transitions, but the idea is, well, we did this so far, why not? Well, now, what I'd like to tell you today is how we can look at these materials, uh, with this, these ideas as foundations, and look at quantum criticality, but in these materials. What are the challenges and what are the opportunities? So the first question I have for you is, is there a simpler way of getting this? This is a pretty, uh, and it's a muscular calculation. Is, is there a simpler way of getting these simple results? We're going to do that in a minute. But let me tell you that, of course, the, the bad boy of the, or the bad girl, the bad person of the 60s and 70s was strontium titanate. It was sort of like the black sheep in the family because baron titanate was the poster child, and strontium titanate was like the rebellious cousin, which is, of course, why I like this material. So strontium titanate is hypervalent, it's barium titanate. Um, it looks like it's, it has a very similar structure. It looks like a pseudo-ferroelectric. It has a cubic to tetragonal transition, but it never does. Okay. However, it was studied a lot by Moore and Burkhart. Ferroelectricity can be induced very easily by uniaxial stress, calcium, O18 substitution. My colleague David Vanderbilt showed that quantum fluctuations are very important in preventing this system from going ferroelectric. Now, you might ask, wait a minute, quantum fluctuations, we used for that for light atoms like helium, titanium isn't that light. But what David and his colleagues showed is that you have two very states that are very close together the ferroelectric state and the anti ferro distorted state. 
to the quantum fluctuation where the tiebreaker exists. So this became called a quantum parelectric. And the critical mode, as with very tight H, is an optical phonon. And in fact, as we studied in by neutron scattering uh, by Hamada and Chernali, the when the dielectric constant gets very large, there's a soft phonon. And that's related to the why the spherical model works so well for this effect. So that's striking tightening. Okay, and it's going to be it's coming into its own these days, as we will discuss. But it was the rebellious cousin back in the 60s and 70s. Okay, so now the the question on the table is how can we get this susceptibility? Susceptibility to goes as one over t squared. Okay, so let's remind ourselves a little bit. We've heard already a number of talks about quantum phase transition, quantum fluctuation. Let's just go over that again. This is predominantly for the students here. We know from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that the change in time goes as h bar over delta e. Okay, I'm trying to be good here and putting in our print. Okay, I'm trying to be good here and putting my h bar. So we can think of it in quantum fluctuations, the crucial thing is space coherence. And we can think of a decoherent time scale, Tp, that is proportional to h bar over kdt. That means at zero temperature, we will have uh, uh, coherence on very long time scales. But at finite temperatures, we will have coherence up to this time scale. And as you know, in quantum, in, in a quantum system, the crucial energy is h bar omega. Those in the classical system, it's kdt. The public dynamics are important. Uh, if we have a system where omega goes like q to the d, then what we can say is that we have a quantum correlation volume with a time which, where we have quantum fluctuations up to some time of the length time and up to some spatial correlation length, this to the one over d. Okay. So even at finite temperatures, we have a classical correlation volume, but we have a core as long as our quantum correlation length is larger than the lattice spacing, we have a core of quantum fluctuations. Now, at t equals zero, of course, the fluctuations are purely quantum, but at finite temperatures, the fluctuations are quantum up to this time scale and classical beyond. So, of course, at t equals zero, we have a quantum critical point and the fluctuations are purely quantum. So, let's just go over this. Uh, so, the time scale, well, it depends what you mean with the particular temperature. I would say, well, as you know, in this is an idea, as you know, in, in uh, diamonds, diamonds we have quantum fluctuations even at room temperature, right? Because uh, that's uh, because we have a KDT, we have a heat that is not constant. So you're asking about the time scale. I actually don't know. Do you know what the time scale is at room temperature for the Planck time? You know what this time would be? I'm sorry, I don't know. I just put all the constants wrong enough in effect. That's what I was going to say. I usually said H bar to be one and KBT to be one. Yeah, so it's one, but in some you yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's why I'm not very fast. No, 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 I know, but that's why I was curious whether it's seconds, years, nanoseconds, or 20 gigahertz per Kelvin. Pardon? 20 gigahertz per Kelvin. Okay. So if it's 20 gigahertz, anyone see that time? Minus 11 seconds. 10 to the minus 11. Right, I think so. Okay. Is that right? Okay, sorry. Yeah. No, no, I, I think you're right. Yeah. So it's it's 10 to the minus 11. Okay, so it's pretty short. Sure. Yeah. I mean, for, for normal okay, sure. events, it's not going to be. Even one thousand. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so classical criticality. So are there any other questions? Since I don't know. Okay, other uh, so classical criticality we have, for example, we have magnetization, we have local fields. Here we have a critical classical criticality all the way down, and we have 
thermofluctuation. However, with quantum criticality, we have temperature, then we have another tuning parameter. We have the quantum critical point, quantum fluctuation, but here we have quantum and thermal fluctuation. Remember, we have a correlation volume, which is quantum up to some time scale that goes like one over the temperature and up to a length scale that goes at one over that temperature to one over d, where d is related to the dispersion. And beyond that, we have classical. At some point, that quantum, once that quantum length scale is aborted, the lattice can be, which obviously happens at more high temperatures. So classical is KBT, quantum H bar times T. So let's just see this in a real material. This is uh, from my former colleague, Kate Beckley. Uh, this is another uh, dipolar, uh, uh, a dipolar ID antiferromagnet. Chloride, we have a classical phase transition here. As I lower the temperature, we have a correlation length that develops uh, with uh, temperature. Okay. Here, this is a similar kind of problem to what Shivaji was talking about yesterday. Here we have an ID model with a transverse magnetic field. Okay. The magnetic field is our, is our quantum tuning parameter. Okay. Here, we have a correlation length that scales as the magnetic field to some exponent. But as we just discussed, at finite temperatures, we have a correlation length that goes as t to the minus one over d. That's because our Planck scale goes as one over t, and then our correlation length goes as the Planck, Planck times the minus one over d. One over d. Okay. And the crucial thing is that because we have to include dynamics, when we do our statistical mechanics, we have to sum over space time configurations. And so we have an effective dimension, which is our spatial dimension, plus D, which is our dynamical. Okay. All right. So let's see if we can quickly and somewhat roughly rederive the, the Russian result. Now we're in the marginal dimension. Okay. Marginal dimension means you have mu field theory plus logarithmic correction. But the other thing we can do, which is rough and ready, not completely legitimate, but rebellious, is we can do scaling assuming that we're missing logarithmic correction. So we talked about the fact that temperature is like a finite, is a, is a boundary condition on time. So let's see if we can get the susceptibility using finite size effects. So let's remember in classical renormalization, classical scaling, what happens if we're near a classical critical point? When you're a classical critical point, you have a correlation length that, that goes as t to the minus mu. Okay? So that's how our correlation length t is being reduced to temperature. So our susceptibility goes as t to the minus gamma. Okay, that's the that's the exponent times some function that's L over psi, okay? And normally L is much less than psi, we don't worry about this too much, but this is goes as T to the minus gamma phi of L over T minus mu, okay? But what if we put our system in a box, okay? If we put our system in a box of length L, suppose L is less than the correlation length, then our susceptibility better be a function of that L, okay? Because it doesn't know about what's going on beyond the box. So how do we do that? Well, our susceptibility is T to the minus gamma. We're going to assume that this function is a power law function of L over psi. When we do that, we have L T to the minus gamma by L over T minus mu. Now we have to make sure that our gamma, our, 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 our um, susceptibility is, is only a function of L. So as a result, the value of the T has to be gamma over T, okay, because otherwise we have T coming in. And so as a result, our susceptibility goes as L to the gamma over U. Okay. 
because we can't have any, we can't know anything about what's going on with the correlation there. So you can put it in a box. We can play exactly the same game with time. And how do we do that? Again, we're going to be ignoring logarithmic corrections. So we're exploiting the fact that in the marginal dimension, we can use daily up to logarithmic corrections. Here, the correlation length goes as our tuning parameter g to the minus mu. That tells me since omega goes like g to the z, that means that our correlation in time goes with psi to the z. So that means that our correlation time goes as g to the minus mu. And we're putting our system in a box in time, which is h bar over q. That's just like the Planck time we were talking about. Okay, so how does this work? So in a, in a thermodynamic system, we have this flexibility that goes as g to the minus gamma times this function, g to the minus gamma, this function of L psi over g to the minus mu. Fine. That's what happens if we're at t equals zero. But now we're putting the system at finite temperature, which is like putting in a box in time. So what we're doing is we're saying for L tau is much, much less than phi tau, whose susceptibility is a function of L tau, then here we have the susceptibility is G minus gamma, L tau over psi tau to some power. But because our susceptibility can only be a function of L tau, that power, this is what we did before, has to be gamma over mu. So we get that this goes as L tau gamma over z mu, but we know that L tau goes as one over t, so this goes as t to the minus gamma over z mu. Now near a polar quantum critical point, we are describing the system by a spherical model. T that we have, we know that we have u to the one, u to the half, gamma equals one, we have gamma over z mu equals two. So we get that I go this one. So just from using these very simple ideas, by no means rigorous, but very simple, we can get the main result. Or this is a misnote. In the beginning, we spoke about different space dimensions relating to yes. space. Now here you're taking all space dimensions equal, right? Yes, I'm not worried about. Space, I'm just interested just in interested time in because minutes. that's the only way I'll get the temperature. I won't get any temperature. So, but you couldn't put that situation that there is one spatial dimension which has a k. Yes. So, and additionally, time. Yes, mm -hmm. but I didn't do that. Yes, you can. Yes, we can. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions? All right. So, what about screening effects? If you screen the dipoles, uh, then you have a gap, and you have a Crossover, you have to switch to the Yeah, so actually, we're going to be taught there are two things. First of all, we have dipolar interaction, which I haven't told you about. Dipolar interaction in insulating systems lead to a gap between the transverse optical load and the load of the system. So I don't have to worry about that. But we're going to add electrons to this case we need to be very important. We're, we're getting there. Right now, we're still insulating things, but you're anticipating mm -hmm. what I'm, and that's going to be quite important when we get. So I'm getting there. So um, these are some measurements that were done um, up the road at Cambridge. Um, strontium titanate is naturally not quite at its critical point. Uh, what they can do is they can add oxygen 18. And in fact, not only do this is inverse susceptibility, uh, it's dielectric susceptibility, not only do they get T squared, but when they're away from the critical point, this goes up, which is exactly what Dima Kaminsky at Kaminsky and Schneerson measured when Larkin wanted them to go off and do a calculation you know, away from the critical point. They can actually move specifically to the critical point with pressure. So there's been a, there's been a resurgence of work on this. And after that paper, actually, there were a number of other papers that cropped up. Uh, the old poster child, very tiny. It turns out this pressure 
you can get a quantum critical point, a number of these other materials. And what um, Gil tells me is because these are pressure sensitive, a lot of sensitive materials, one of the things that he gets excited about studying quantum criticality is that you can get a very broad temperature range for a factor of 10 less than what you have for magnetic because you know, up to up to here you have eight digit pascals and you have a temperature range of 400. That's partly because it's a lot of incidents. Okay, so these are incidents. Now, what are some of the key concepts of quantum criticality? Well, we have a symmetry breaking transition. The tuning parameter is not the temperature. The physics is determined by the nature of the critical soft mode. We have the importance of dynamics. Okay, that makes it somewhat different. We have a state of matter with quantum fluctuations at all state, at all scales. And of course, we're interested, as we've already heard in these talks already, about novel quantum phases. But as Frank already alluded, most of the motivation in quantum criticality is to exotic metallurgy, particularly the unconventional superconductivity. So what do polar materials have? Well, it turns out, and just to give sort of uh, a very brief uh, overview of that, in quantum criticality of metals, this is, and we've already heard about this, we've had very exotic behaviors, uh, we have strange metals, we have emerging orders, the behavior depends on the, on the type of quantum critical point. Uh, here are some examples. And the question is, can polar materials contribute at all? Okay. And you might argue that, look, if you are interested in universality, you should have these kinds of coasts, but what can they contribute? Okay, they're influenced. Well, turns out that they're not always good. So a polar metal, let's look at strontium tightening. Turns out that if you add calcium, okay, it's the calcium in the world that's the human. You can get a critical boson. You can get a transverse optical phonon to plus zero, and you can drive it for a little bit. But similarly, if you remove oxygen, you can get a metal and actually a superconductor. So across the channel, Kamen Bania and, and uh, collaborators have actually looked at what happens when you drive it both ferroelectric and metallic at the same time. And it turns out that even though this paper is relatively recent, this is a very old idea. Okay. Um, what happens in a polar metal? Well, as Frank alluded to, you can get CD. Okay. So Anderson and Blount in the 60s actually suggested a polar metal. Okay. They said, what happens if you take a polar insulator and sprinkle it with electrons? Well, you're going to get screening, so you obviously you won't get a macroscopic dipole moment. You may get a local dipole moment, but you can get an inversion symmetry breaking transition. It's isostructural with ferroelectricity. You'll have a polar axis. You just won't have a local dipole. You won't have a macroscopic dipole. And it turns out that intrinsic and engineered polar materials do in fact exist. Okay, this is the this is the uh, data from Paris, for example, on um, strontium calcium titanate. Uh, it has a polar transition it, at low temperatures. It also has a timber conducting transition, which we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and it turns out that in the search for vile semi-metals, which has been very active recently, there's been a number of polar semi-metals that have been discovered. Okay? And in fact, as you see from this, you can actually chemically tune the TC down to zero. And so the question is, can we get interesting behavior at low temperatures with quantum fluctuation? So polar quantum criticality, the idea is that you have to do lattice sensitive settings for the exploration of exotic phases, but a key motivation is the link with novel metallic behavior and exotic superconductivity. What happens when we add electrons to a quantum critical polar insulator? 
Well, the mod criteria is usually that you have concentration of electrons to the one third times the bore, uh, the bore radius is about a third. Okay, and remember that the bore radius is a dielectric constant times this. Okay. Now, because the dielectric constant is so large, that tells us that we have a very, very dilute mass. If you look at four radius for carrier concentration, something can't make its way up here. Okay. So what that tells us is for very, very low, uh, for very, very low carrier radius, we can actually get a metal. And the polar metals have very interesting properties. For example, the ring city knows it's eight and square. And you might say, well, that's not a big deal. That's what we expect for some liquid. But it goes way beyond the Fermi temperature. And so the question is, what's going on here? It's very unusual transport. Okay. Um, now you might say weak versus strong coupling. So normally we calculate RS by looking at the ratio of the Coulomb to kinetic energy. KS is one over KS AB. A is Coulomb versus one over R. R is already six by the six and third. Kinetic energy goes like Kf squared, which is n to the two third. So we get Rs is one over Kf AB and Kf is n to the one third. Now, normally, if you have a very dilute system, we think, well, we're in a strong couple. But here, once again, because of the fact that our the electric susceptibility is so large. We have a system which is weakly interacting, so we can treat it with weak coupling. So the question is, can we get novel metallicity near polar quantum critical point? Here we have spontaneously broken inversion symmetry. We have a couple of engineered engineered polar metals. There is titanate, mounted calcium, titanate, intrinsic polar metals, lithium osmate, tungsten ditelluride, aluminum titelluride, the latest system. And we can tune the polar transition with chemical substitution and spraying and pressure. So the question is can we get exotic treatment? Okay. So usually quantum criticality in metals, what are we looking for? Well, we usually look at couplings between the soft mode and the gapless particle hole excitation. Okay. And for example, in hertz millet, we have a damping of the bosonic dynamic. Beyond hertz millet, we have non the liquids. And of course, we would love to have something like that. And the kind of signatures we get, we get we look at the heat, the acidity, but the specifics depend on the type of quantum critical point. So what can we say about polar quantum critical method? Well, our critical mode is a polar optical phonon. Okay. It breaks inversion symmetry. As we'll see, that will be a challenge, but also an opportunity. It's a Q equals zero. As we're going to see, there's going to be, and we'll talk about that more in a minute, there's no direct coupling to the charge density without spin orbit. It breaks inversion symmetry, the transverse optical mode. It doesn't couple directly to the critical mode. Okay. If we take the usual Froelich electron photon interaction, okay, that's no good here because there you couple the photon displacement to the electron density. But in the Q going to zero limit, that's not going to give you anything interesting. So it's irrelevant for the critical point. So the challenge is how do we get a strong electronic coupling to the critical mode? How do we do this? Okay. Can we do it? But as I learned from my Chinese friends, the character for crisis and opportunity are the same. So we have a challenge, but we also have an opportunity. So the opportunity 
it may have a setting to study new collectible electronic behavior being used by unconventional lattice dynamics. So, question is can we come up with some sort of strong electronic coupling to critical, pol uh, critical polar mode? And uh, as I was mentioning before in, the, in, in responding to Frank's question, here we're going to assume that it is weak. Assuming limit is weak, you are in the TO, the LO, we have TO LO series. Now, the usual thing that's done here on the critical point is you use your power coupling. Now, I'm always amazed, this is something that I always enjoy about physics. Uh, you probably know that your power coupling was determined was originally postulated for the megalon. So we use a very similar coupling in kinetic matter. So here we have the power coupling. This is the usual coupling that's used to produce strong correlation for other QCPs. Which is saying again with LOTO? Oh, longitudinal optical and transverse optical. We have the soft mode is a transverse optical mode. But we also have longitudinal optical mode, and there's a splitting between them. So when we look at the critical mode, we're only interested in the TO modes. Is that is that a justification? So here, the question here, the, in most other quantum physics, we're interested in the decoupled coupling. So we couple the electronic density to the order parameter. But we can't do that here because our order parameter breaks inversion symmetry. Okay? So we can't do that because we need. We need, it, we need this overall to, uh, to obey our solutions. So the question is, can we get a Yukawa type coupling near a polar point critical point? So how do electrons couple to the inversion symmetry that we see? So what we want is a fermionic bilinear that breaks inversion symmetry, but not time reversal symmetry. We're going to assume for the moment because, for example, in strontium tightening, barium tightening, we're going to assume that we don't break time reversal symmetry, but we do break inversion symmetry. How do we do that? So we want to postulate a coupling that looks like this. And let's start simply. Let's assume that we have a single conduction band. And let's ask, what do we need from this fermionic bilinear? Well, if we write this fermionic bilinear in this form, if we take F0 to be even in K, so if it's even in K, uh, parity is conserved, but so is time reversal. So that's no good. We want to break top parity, but retain time reversal. But on the other hand, if we take F0 to be odd, we take F0 to be odd, well, then we'll break parity. So that means F0 of K minus F0 minus K. Then we'll break parity, but we'll also break time reversal because K, uh, it's K and minus K. So that's no good. The only way we can make this work for a single uh, conduction band is if we include a Pauli here, which means spin orbit scattering. Okay, we're going to include a spin orbit reaction. Many of my colleagues in the field have actually done that. Okay. But we're going to say let's try and keep it very simple. So it's not possible to have inversion symmetry breaking without time reversal symmetry breaking for single conduction electron band. Okay, so there are two possibilities. Either you invoke spin orbit scattering or you go multi-band. And that's the way it's. And you might say, well, why do we believe that there's anything interesting there in the first place? Because it's all very contrived and using some sort of mental acrobatics. But this is where experiment is telling us there's something very interesting. Okay, and that's what's driving this. There's several experimental puzzles that defy conventional explanation. So let me tell you an interesting story about superconductivity in strontium titanate. Okay. Strontium titanate. Uh, as you know, I like history. And strontium titanate, so in, as you know, at the late, in the late 50s, there was the very successful theory of Barbini super okay. And something that was realized in the community was that metals that were not good conductors 
were very good superheroes. And metals that were not good superheroes, for example, copper was never not by itself as not a particularly good superconductor. But metals that were not good conductors were very good superconductors. So Marvin Cohen, who was uh, an expert in semiconductors, what he decided was he said, why don't why don't we we know that the type of superconductivity we get is determined by the normal state. And we also know that semiconductors are bad conductors and they've been studied a lot for obvious reasons. We were just done with this one, and of course, they knew a lot about semiconductors. There had been a paper from Russia by Larkin, Gurvich, uh, and Pierzov, where they had actually looked at polar superconductors and they had decided that they were looking at was they said instead of doing electron phonons with the usual phonons, why not do it with longitudinal optical phonons and measure the system? But they came to the conclusion that in polar semiconductors it would not work because the Fermi energy was just too low. We needed to have a phonon energy that was lower than the Fermi energy. So Marvin Cohen worked a lot on germanium and gallium arsenide which, as you may know, are multivalent. At that time, the band structure of strontium titanate was not known. Okay? But Marvin Cohen knew that strontium titanate had been studied a lot. Okay? This is the 60s, less than 10 years after he did this. Okay? He knew about Larkin's paper, okay? and he knew that in strontium titanate, it was dilute, but one did have issues about screening. So what Marvin Cohen said, and I really highly recommend his paper in the Parks book, is he said, look, what's the best way to get around? What, what's the problem with having a very low Fermi energy? The problem with having a very low Fermi energy is that you have a lot of trouble getting up around Coulomb repulsion. Okay? The usual way BTS gets around Coulomb repulsion is with retardation. Or with angular momentum. However, what Marvin Cohen said was he said, Coulomb repulsion is a K for zero effect. Okay, so let's take into account, let's make a prediction for strontium tightening, assuming that it's like its other semiconductors, multi valley. Let's have, uh, let's assume that we have multi valley coupling where. We can have the sum of large k vectors in such a way that we avoid Coulomb repulsion. Okay. So that was his argument. And he did a very nice calculation based on that, where he calculated a Tc as a function of density when he saw dome. Remember, this is 1664. Okay. Then he went to his experimental friend, by that time he moved to Berkeley. Kunz et al. and asked them to do the experiment. Well, they looked at doped strontium titanate, and look what he found. You see, as a function of density of the dome, and you give me the key domes and other heads. Okay, this is a dome. This is the first. Okay, this is a dome, and it fit the theory really well. In fact, I think Marvin Cohen got the Buckley Award. There's a slight twist to the tail. Strontium titanate, the, the band structure was calculated by Red Matters. It was not multi valued. So the theory that predicted the experiment and inspired the experiment is completely wrong. Okay. So to this day, we don't know why we have superconductivity. Well, I'm going to tell you on Friday what I think the theory is part of it, but I'm just saying it's a subject. So, what first of all, beware theorists who are telling you that because they fit domes that things work. Okay, but to be fair, Marvin Cohen was completely upfront about it. He said this, these are his assumptions, this is what happened. But what's amazing is that the experiment, I mean, this is a, this is a theoretical line, it's beautiful. Isn't it? But it's based on assumptions that are just not right. So, so this is a system which 
It's a very simple system. Most string fluctuations are not new, but it defies convention. So, in a moment at the end of my time, let me just finish. I'm finishing with mystery. Does anyone have any questions? I have a question. So, transport in endo strunk and tightness. Uh, this is from a beautiful review by Pilot and Benia and his colleague. Transport in endo strunk and tightness. I think I mentioned it before that it goes at T squared to very high temperatures. Uh, the origin of the robustness of this T squared dependent. There are some interesting theories about this. Okay, the normal state transport is not well understood. Okay. Um, it's been seen in a number of systems. It doesn't seem to depend on how you dope strontium titanate. What seems to happen? Now let's talk about superconductivity. In superconductivity, people have doped strontium titanate in many different ways. It turns out that the really low part is probably filamentary, but this part is, which is basically what uh, what the Berkeley group saw initially is real. We have Tf of about 15 Kelvin, depending on the density, the by temperature of about 400. So Tf is much, much less than T by. So we have the opposite situation of Tf. You have slow electrons and fast photons. Okay, remember that in BCS, we have fast electrons and slow photons. Carrying energy that's high, and the by energy that's low. Here we have exactly the opposite. Okay. But the interesting thing is, even though it doesn't fit with the ideas of this yet, uh, um, if you go to, if you look at T gap over TC, it's the BCS value. So it's sort of teasing us. So what are the challenges here? How do we overcome Coulomb? The usual way to overcome Coulomb function is with retardation. Okay, we have a separation of scales. We have the electron fast, the photon slow. We can't use that. Okay. The other way that's quite standard is to have angular momentum. Okay. To say, okay, we're going to have carrying a different angular momentum. But we can't do that here. It's isotopic. Now, we talked quite a bit before about the fact that the electron density doesn't couple easily to the critical phonon, but it's been shown, and this is data from the Cambridge group of the road, the logic is good, that PC increases with proximity to the polar quantum critical point. So how is this going on? It's not so easy to couple to the critical phonon. So how is this going on? The critical mode is a transverse optical phonon. There is negligible direct coupling between the electrons and the soft mode, unless there's spin orbit coupling. The spin orbit coupling will give you a linear um, temperature dependence of resistivity, which is not seen. And the question then is can polar criticality drive the new superconductivity? So we talked about. Polar quantum criticality between a new lattice sensitive setting for the exploration of exotic phases. The key motivation for quantum criticality is the state of novel metallicity and exotic superconductivity. The question is can these materials offer anything in this direction? They were usually studied for applications. <coughs> when I decided to look at them at the temperatures, actually, me and the super electric scene said, but what are the applications? Superconductivity breaks many rules. <coughs> Slow electrons and fast photons. How to overcome Coulomb repulsion. We know that quantum critical fluctuations enhance the superconductivity. Stay tuned. On Friday, I'll tell you a little bit about my ideas about how to get or our ideas about how to get uh, how one can get non thermodynamic behavior and superconductivity in these systems. And I mentioned. Uh, to you that I'm often asked, what are the applications? And uh, one of my 
favorite stories. I, I used to work in the industry. And so the vice president would often come by and say, what are you working on? How is this gonna help the bottom line of this company? So one of my favorite answers is due to some Londoners, so I just thought I should say it. I'm actually just reading the biography, a wonderful biography from Michael Faraday. Uh, when Michael Faraday developed what we call the, now the Faraday effect, um, he was visited by the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And he did his measurement, and the Chancellor of the Exchequer, whose name I've forgotten, um, but I do remember Michael Faraday's name, said, Of what use is it? And the famous saying was that Michael Faraday said, Some days there are more short attacks. So, anyway, I can't say that, but I used to always have to talk to the Vice President about what use it is. But it turns out, but there are new applications for low temperature polar materials because for reasons that no one seems to understand, they're robust to cosmic radiation. So they're actually used for satellite means. Even though they do heat up magnetic means, the semiconductor means uh, in, in terms of cosmic radiation for satellite means. So thank you very much. I think I'm going to Friday, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the research I've been doing. Maybe about 15 minutes or something. People systematically studied isotope effects and is there any unusual dependence on the isotope? Um, the isotope is a little bit complicated because of the fact that it also takes you closer to the surface things. So there are some papers, for example, by Vanderbilt's group where they talk about unusual isotope effects, which is uh, basically oxygen. Uh, you don't get the standard sort of PCS effect. However, it's driving you closer to the point, critical point also. So it would be very nice to have, so that's why it's a little bit different from the isotope that we use. So you can't play exactly with the isotope that is without moving you to the quantum critical point. Um, because when you increase the mass. So that hasn't been really done. The only thing that's been done to my knowledge is the only thing that's been done to my knowledge is people have looked at what kind of TV with oxygen EP and they found that it's not the usual PTS, but I'm not sure what that means because it's mm -hmm. closer to the point of the So at least my reading of it is that it would be closer to the point of the and then PC for now. So you have to come with, take you have to disentangle the two factors. Yes. Oh, go ahead. I, I don't know who's next. Anyway. I have a question about this uh, classical critical point that is K. Are there corrections that make it uh, something else then? Quantum or from the classical or frustration? Frustration correction changes analog of the dynamic of the thing. Uh, you mean in the uniaxial case, yes. it's a spatial dimension yes, exactly. that yeah. has QZ. Yes, yes, yes. And so I guess this was purely classical. And can but there be corrections? It, 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 in, in principle, there could be, but I haven't looked at that. I think there have been people who've looked at quantum uniaxial parametric, but I don't But even in the classical, you could ask for it. Uh, that's true. That's true. But they only looked at, yeah, they were in the marginal dimension, so they didn't look at that. The, the key thing for them was this was an experimental material that was in effectively compostable. But you're right, there could be corrections. Yeah, they actually, Millis and Rusev were the first in many ways to bring. I, I'm sorry, I didn't do a lot of referencing it, but I didn't reference myself either. So I just referenced mm -hmm. the Russian. But um, Millis, Andy Millis, uh, Millis and Rusev were really the first to sort of bring these papers to the attention of the quantum critical community. To, to what extent is it possible to, to stabilize the ferroelectrics in general of effects you see in, in ferromagnets and magnetic systems? And can, can you get skirmions, for example, in, in such systems <coughs> or, or um, modulate it? It hasn't been explored as much. It hasn't been explored. There are people that came to speak to Scott Butler. There, but it hasn't been explored as much. I mean, they have first order transitions. <clears throat> but it honestly hasn't been explored as much. So I don't know. It's always tied to 
one polar axis of the clock? Uh, well, I don't, I think you can, I mean, I've always assumed that it's one polar axis. Because it's picked by the tetragonal. It's picked by the crystal lattice. And so that's when it's pushing the lattice. It can't get the, the correlation symmetry right here at all. Well, you can, but you can have a much more complicated story. But I, I believe people have seen early on that they can show some associations. I'm likely to have that to be the next one. I don't think so. I don't think it's even it's like impossible to just paint one line. Well, because of anisotropic strength. Yeah. That's, that's why I, I think people have claimed to see things like that, but I'm not sure. You spoke about this role of the square in the Yeah. Are you going to give an answer on Friday? Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit. Of, on Friday, I'm going to think what uh, Dmitry Maslov and Abish Kumar, who's now at Rutgers, did was they explained it's using a two phonon approach. What we're going to do is what Beers and Pavel and I have done is we've taken that approach, which works for the so that with normal state transport, and ask what it does in the superconductor. So that's what I'm going to talk about on Friday. I just ask the double bandwidth to there are some extra things that's where we should have a T square. So why is it unusual to me? Because it's T much greater than TF. So your point is TF is about 10 degrees and it's going up to 100 degrees. So I have no trouble with yeah. the low, but the point is that why are you doing it so, 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 so temperature is so large? Uh, yeah, so this is well, it turns out that the, the rating theory that seems to work, which Mr. Marshall has, he said, is actually two times that. And, and so then you can get a T squared. But there the problem is at low temperatures, because the two phonon pattern at low temperatures is expected to be exponential when you go below the phonon. We don't see that. So yeah, I guess it's probably what you can see. Maybe well, there's some accident. Right. But why well, why it should go straight yeah. through is not obvious at That's all. It. So there was also a question about the stuff that the small that actually has no right. That's Cameron Benia talks about that. There's no old plot. Right. So it's not it's not clear that even the term, usual thermal liquid approach works because thermal liquid approach is based on old plot. Yeah. So well. Well, it could be. People have tried to look at polar. One of the problems has been that that's a different approach to what we're doing, what you're doing. And one of the problems is you need to have a certain person who works in the other temperature. That's the only one that seems to work so well. But that doesn't mean we're still, still in the creative. Lost about when you discussed the form of the power company. Either I missed it or you didn't resolve it. We did resolve it. I see. I see. Because no, I'm going to talk about it more, I, see, I think, on Friday. What's, what's wrong? You said you don't want to put a poly matrix, but why? You could why, put a poly if, you, if, you, if you have this conversion symmetry breaking, why, why can't you get just a k dot sigma terms, one that model like the other side? Well, but that assumes it's going to work. Well, this k dot sigma term just comes from the inversion symmetry. Oh, I see what you're saying. Now, in this case, what I'm, what we're going to do is I can put 
in order to have a single band, I can just, if I have a single band, we're going to talk about it. Part, and if I have a single band, I either have to break chimerosal. I, I can't the function I I can't break parity without breaking time of If I do the Kelly movement, then I'm fine. Yeah, yeah, but in evidence mean, size you just have to use in 20 letters for our trade you have this table signal. Yeah, that's not good. It doesn't have the inversion symmetry. Yeah, but the inversion symmetry gets broken. No, 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 no
Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, it's all like this. this one somehow doesn't let's see again. Let's do this. Yeah. I cannot do without this and switch slides. I fear that I have to do now it works maybe. I see now it comes back somehow. Oh, okay. It seems to work now. Yeah. Okay, so um, final talk of the day. My suggestion is everybody slows down their um, metabolism to allow more oxygen to the speaker, <laughs> if possible. Uh, yeah, not too soon. <laughs> In that order. <laughs> Maybe a photo photo after. Anyway, um, yes, we'll say what's happening after the talk. After the talk, um, for now there's a talk. Um, it's Elio. Uh, he was introduced yesterday, so I won't do it again. Um, I'm sorry. Sorry. It might have changed. You know, okay, I'll introduce Elio. <laughs> well, that's good or bad. I shared an office with Elio for a while. So. Um, uh, I know him back when he was a um, PhD student in Karlsruhe. Um, he then went on to the US, to Rutgers, and anywhere else with before them. moving to um, to uh, Wisconsin. Yeah. Okay, before uh, returning to Germany, where he's currently a computer in Stuttgart, uh, Max Planck is And he's an excellent coach. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> also, a reasonable musician, good footballer. Um, I could go on. Generally, a good guy to share an office with if you ever get a chance. So, with that in mind, um, let's hear about entanglement and topology and triplets. Okay, very good. Thanks so much for the introduction. Um, okay, uh, I'll try to keep you awake. Uh, and exactly this is the second talk that I'm giving here. And it's actually uh, two stories that I'm telling you. Uh, and for both stories, there are two collaborators, out of which two are at the conference, namely Pierce and Jörg, and different parts of this. Uh, and uh, the other collaborators are Yasha Komijani, who is now at Cincinnati, uh, junior faculty, and Michelle Ramp, who is now a PhD student in Dresden. And the common theme, actually, of this talk is um, uh, Strong quantum fluctuations in triplet superconductors. Okay, that's in a second. Okay, so um, I'll start with the, the part which is with Pierce and Yashar, and I'll start with the motivation to it. And the motivation goes back to uh, the early days of the Coup rates. And here you see Phil Anderson sitting next to Georg Bednard. So he was close to the source of information at the Woodstock of Physics. And this is the phase diagram of the Coup rates as of 1927. Uh, and I just use this to motivate to understand the idea of RBB theory. So RBB theory is the following. Uh, at the modulating state, it's sort of uh, postulated that it is uh, described uh, by an RBB state as a ground state, which is of course um, not exactly the case in, in experiment, but maybe the experimental state is somewhere close to it. Um, and uh, this RBB state is actually a quantum string that you uh, and it's a, a state which is a superposition of all sorts of uh, single bonds between, so these are single bonds between different sides of the square rate. <clears throat> okay, and then the idea of RBB theory as a means of getting superconductivity from entanglement rather than as in BCS theory is that you can dope this system and you already have three entangled pairs and that essentially to get a superconductor, all that you have to do is just add torque, um, and that will be sort of becoming immediately a superconductor uh, rather than a magnet. Yeah? Okay, and in heavy fermions, a similar mechanism uh, can be a place, and instead of doping, you would have a uh, condo coupling, which is uh, uh, maybe coupling this to some conduction electrode, the spin liquid to some conduction electrodes. Okay, so the idea here is pairing from entanglement, you start from a spin liquid. And you sort of dope it and you get a superconductor. There's a the reverse situation that you could think of. You get a T-wave superconductor. The reverse situation would be you think of the spin liquid as a quantum disordered superconductor. After all, the, the RVV state is a good solar projected BCS state. Right? So it means that you have killed the, the possibility of having a so essentially it's a quantum disorder in the sense that um, 
I think it's charging energy or something. The face has been uh, quantum disorder. It's good. Good. Um, so what I'm actually going to speak about today is entanglement topology in triplet superconductors rather than the singlet D wave superconductor. And the first question that I would like to address is whether we can extend this RBB theory to uh, systems with local paramagnetic interactions. Uh, and is it actually a way to create triplet pairing rather than singlet pairing? Uh, and from there, we'll actually go from, a, from an analogous story of this uh, single orbital problem. I will go on to a multi orbital discussion of a uh, superconductivity from entanglement to local paramagnetic interactions. Uh, and then I'll switch actually here to something completely different at first sight, uh, which is uh, quantum fluctuations in triplet pairing. Now I'm going actually from right to left. Uh, uh, but there is the common theme, which is this quantum fluctuations. Okay, <clears throat> so I'll start with the first part, which goes by the name of triplet resonating valence bond theory, and this is the part together with Pearson Jackson. So let's start first. What is a valence bond, and then what is a triplet valence bond? So in RVB theory, the valence bond is given by a singlet, which is up one minus down up, and it's actually the ground state of a uh, two side uh, Heisenberg, uh, isotropic Heisenberg model, uh, uh, and uh, which is given here. Okay, and to go from single valence bond theory to triplet valence bond theory, uh, you actually perform for this two side problem just a unitary transformation of 180 degrees of, on one of those two sides, which is going to flip the sign, the relative sign between these two terms here. And you end up with this state. Which is actually the triplet mz equals zero. And of course, uh, if you want to build a spin liquid out of it, uh, what you do is you pile your uh, bonds with all of these, with all of these. So you pile your lattice with bonds of this kind here. And the important bit is that you have you start with L pairs. And of course, this here is the same uh, L pair as, as the same entanglement properties as this one. You can equally, equally well construct spin liquids out of this. In terms of the Hamiltonian, what this means is actually that you're discussing now an, uh, an easy plane for a magnet, right? So it's x, x, so minus x, x, minus y, y, plus z, z. Okay. So what does this imply? If you do, for example, this uh, rotation now for a macroscopic system, you start with an RBB state, let's say on a three dimensional cubic lattice. You can actually go from here to here just by a unitary transformation. And instead of having this RVB state, you end up with the TRVB state. They're, of course, equivalent just because up to unitary transformation. What it translates to in terms of observables, though, is that this one in three dimensions, actually, RVB, uh, even short range RVB, is a way of describing an anti ferment. This state here is actually long range anti ferment. Uh, here it would lead to a long range easy plane ferromagnet. So here we have really states which are. Uh, equivalent by means of this rotation on every other side because it's a bipartite mass. You can also do it in two dimensions. So you know it's a you have a quantum spin liquid in two dimensions, uh, and then you do this rotation and you end up with another quantum spin liquid, but now with local triplet form. Okay. Um, actually, you could also describe this RBB theory as uh, uh, you know could study this RBB theory using an effective timer Hamiltonian. And of course, timer Hamiltonians are actually very similar, both for RVB and TRVB theory. So essentially, there's a one to one. But it gets a little bit more interesting when you leave bipartite lattices. For example, you take a triangular lattice, then you cannot do any more this trick of rotating every other side because the system is not a bipartite lattice. So, in fact, this and this state, they are not anymore related to each other by a unitary transformation. But at the same time, as I said, so it's the same timer model. So, in terms of time, this timer model, description, you actually can uh, conclude that a TRVB state on the triangular lattice actually has Z2 topological order just the same way as you can have for thin. Okay, so um, I would like to actually spend a little bit of time on a microscopic model uh, and materials applications and a, a mean field um, calculation uh, to explain how it works in a single orbital problem. So I'm starting with this Hamiltonian that I already showed. It's, uh, let's say it could be a 2D square or triangular lattice with this uh, easy plane ferromagnetic interactions, minus xx, minus yy, plus zz. 
And plus dot 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 means that okay, ultimately I'm going to speak about spin liquids, and I don't have uh, a I don't have a Hamiltonian where I know that the RBP is bound. I'm going to do mean field theory as a way of controlling it in a large n way. Uh, if you want, this is what dot 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 could mean, or dot 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 or extra terms which are normal or further further apart interactions. But if you just look at this part of the Hamiltonian, as I already argued, is what you have here is this is the limit where j z equals j. That's the one that we discussed before, which is related just by 180 degree rotation together. J z equals j here. Then you have as the lowest energy state just the triplet balance bond. This is this m z equals zero triplet. And you have these three states up here. Uh, on the other hand, if you have j z equals minus j, then this is just a thermagnetic Heisenberg interaction. So you have the triplet as the lowest state. And we're interested in the regime where this this state has is sufficiently low as compared to these states, so that we can sort of uh, consider the effective physics described by this triplet balance bond, which can give us some enhancement. In terms of applications, it turns out that actually this kind of Hamiltonian here appears in the description of the mod insulating states in uh, twisted uh, transition metal homopi layers. Uh, it turns out that so this is a picture of it. Right? This is tungsten diselenide twisted. Uh, what you can see here is actually uh, this um, mod insulating state in experiment in uh, resistivity measurements. And um, the reason why you get this this term here, which is a term which you know it needs to have you need some spin orbit coupling in, in the problem to get this kind of term here, it is actually inherited from the spin valley locking that we have in uh, this twisted or generally in in this uh, tungsten diselenide. Ultimately, what, what you get then from the spin valley locking is ultimately you get a, an effective Hubbard model on the Moiré super lattice. This Hubbard model has spin dependent hopping. Uh, so, uh, and actually, this can even change the sign for the different spin components, allowing to ultimately have a gate tunable as a function of the displacement field J over JZ, which is between minus one and minus two. We also uh, argue that it might have so this this, uh, this triplet RBB theory might have some applications also to uh, a quantum uh, spin liquid candidate material or class of candidate materials, which is tantalum disulfide, tantalum diselenide. Um, these are actually spin liquid candidate materials which appear on a charge density wave super lattice. So this is actually a uh, artist's impression of this. Um, it has a the charge density wave actually leads to this. Uh, formation of Star of David, where uh, 13 or actually 12 uh, uh, tantalum atoms are, are contracted towards the central tantalum atom. And uh, as a, the, the band structure that you get effectively for this um, in the charge density wave uh, involves uh, bands such, such that these 12, the electrons stemming from these 12 outer atoms essentially are going to fill some, some states some bands below the Fermi energy. And then ultimately what you're left with is essentially a tight binding model, a Hubbard model, describing electrons hopping from the central site to the next central site. Um, it is actually, uh, what, what it is pretty clear that uh, there is mod physics. And for example, what you can see here is uh, SDM measurements for this tantalum diselenide. Uh, and you see actually Hubbard bands. Uh, you see a nice gap, which is associated with the mod gap, interpreted as a mod gap. Um, it is not exactly clear what the effective uh, um, magnetic Hamiltonian would be like. In fact, it is also not clear, neither experimentally nor uh, theoretically, it's quite clear whether it is really an antiferromagnetic um, uh, Heisenberg model on this triangular uh, Hubbard model. Uh, what you can see here, for example, is so first of all, in theory, theory always, so DFT, up initial theories, tend to predict ferromagnetic interactions. Uh, okay, good, it's up initial, maybe this cannot capture this physics of mod localization here. But also experiments, what you can see here, for example, is the intercepts of um, the one over uh, susceptibility. And uh, here it actually even intercept, has intercepted positive, uh, small positive temperatures. There are other experiments which are more negative temperatures. It's hard to extract from this what the local, um, uh, interaction, sign of interaction. So what we are bringing up here is actually just the idea that could you have a quantum spin liquid out of local ferromagnetic? And 
We're just using the Hamiltonian to see what happens if we do that. And also, we're going to dope this uh, system later, and we'll see what kind of superconductor comes out. It will be a time reversal symmetry breaking P plus IP superconductor. And I don't have a slide for this, but it turns out that for this uh, tantalum disulfide, there is a way of doping it in, a, in, a, in another structure, which is actually a sandwich structure of one funnel spin liquid candidate, one metal, one funnel spin liquid candidate, one metal, or HB tantalum disulfide. And uh, that one actually is a time reversal symmetry breaking superconductor, making some contact to our field. Good. So um, let me show you what we did for this particular Hamiltonian of uh, uh, this uh, spin problem on a square or triangle lattice. Uh, we are doing a mean field calculation, which can also be controlled by a symplectic uh, N method, uh, but I'm going to concentrate here only on the SUP case, which is strictly speaking uncontrolled, but I'm just saying that we also did control calculations. This here is a, a, a calculation in which we're using Aprikosov fermions, pseudo fermions to describe the spin. So for example, the sigma z here is going to be represented by f stagger sigma z f, where f are some pseudo fermions that we introduced we have to impose that there is exactly one fermion per side. So these are uh, Lagrange multipliers, so we're doing this. And we're now doing actually uh, a mean field calculation. That means that we're going to Hubbard's autonomous to couple these terms here. And from that, we're getting actually effective, uh, an effective quadratic Hamiltonian describing the uh, hopping and the pairing of these spin-ons. It will be coupled. So it turns out that the, the mean field solution that we get, okay, let me show it, is going to be with a zero null in either situation. So, so exactly. So the, the mean field order parameters that we have is a hopping of spin ons from side to side. Uh, in the case of the, the square letters, there are two options. We're only looking at homogeneous solutions to the mean field equation. Um, and there are three different hopping terms uh, in the unit cell for the triangular letters. And similarly, there are pairing terms which are taken into account. So we're coupling this both in pairing and hopping. And, uh, and the important bit is that the hopping comes with the sigma z here. That's different as compared to usual arbitrary theory. And is related to this anisotropic, uh, this uh, easy plane anisotropy. And also, the pairing term is actually a, this is trying to give the triplet pair at two adjacent sites with uh, spin orientation m z equals zero. Right, and then you do mean field, and we end up with this: uh, the lowest energy state at the mean field level is a state with these nodes in both cases. And this is actually a, a superconductor. At, at least it has one of the components. At least one of the components of the mean field order parameters. And then next step is to do a TJ, as I said, uh, a TJ model. So we're now doping the system. We're allowing up to one electron per site. And uh, asking the question, what happens on doping to the spin liquid? Uh, we're doing this with slave bosons. Uh, so you have now an additional hopping term. The C dagger C is going to, so C is going to be represented by B dagger F. B is a holon. So whenever you have no electron on the side, you have one B. Uh, and when you have a spin on the side here, uh, then you have an electron that is going to be encoded in the spin on states. So the spin is going to be encoded in the spin on states. And of course, the condition is that um, you have a total occupation of one if you sum up holons and spin ons on a given side. Now, here the new the addition is that fermions and bosons mutually determine nearest neighbor hopping. And that is now actually going to give us the possibility to get uh, a, a real superconductor. So, so far this year is a superconductor of spin-ons, but in reality, it's just a modern insulator. Uh, now we have uh, the charge being uh, uh, liberated and, and the charge can be uh, flowing around. In particular, as soon as these Bs here condense, we get a problem. And thereby one can get actually following phase diagram as a function of temperature doping. So I, I discussed already no doping. Uh, this is actually true essentially the same way for triplet and sorry for a triangular and for the square lattice. 
there is a, a transition temperature at the mean field level, which is describing the appearance of sort of the order parameters for the spin-ons that I discussed before. So both pairing and hopping. And this is called the this is a temperature which describes the appearance of the PRB state. And in this sense, this is a quantum spin liquid, even though I'm speaking here about a finite temperature state. And then there is another temperature which is red here, which is describing a PKT transition where these bosons form a superfluid in two dimensions. And what you get then is you get actually this phase diagram where you have here uh, a state which is not yet a superconductor, it behaves like a, a quantum spin liquid, but with the triplet bonds. Uh, and then out of it, when you dope it, you can get a P plus IP superconductor. And as I mentioned, it has some vague resemblance. To this uh, quantum spin liquid candidate material uh, company as well. Good. So um, this is the part on this. So I spoke so far about a single um, single orbital model on a square and on a triangle lattice, and it's essentially uh, translating what is known by Cotley and you for uh, the case of uh, you know usual antiferromagnetic Heisenberg interactions to our situation of this anisotropic. Um, uh, ferromagnetic system. Now I'm going to switch gears to a multi-orbit. I'm applying TRVB as a concept to multi-orbit systems. And there are several motivations. I'm going to flash two, and then I'm going to discuss a third one in more detail. So um, Piers and Yasha actually started thinking about this um, triplet RVB state because they were discussing their uh, we're collaborating on this experimental paper. It, there is a uh, critical behavior in a ferromagnetic system uh, that's called CRG here, uh, and actually has some. What what they needed is some mechanism that does not lead to a first order transition, as we would potentially expect for this uh, system, and came up with this entanglement due to triplet pairs. Another class of system which is multi-orbital in some way is. Uh, uh, uranium ditelluride and similar heavy fermion systems where uh, you have, again, um, multiple orbitals and uh, Pierce and uh, Mark Knight recently uh, extended the TRVB concept to this system where multiple orbitals, in this case, refers also to conduction uh, electrons and uh, F electrons. But I would like to speak about ion based supercondition. Uh, and ask the question whether TRVB has any uh, way of helping us understanding ion-based superconductors better. So what's, what's the question about ion-based superconductors that is open? And I think this is an important question that, that is open and has not been discussed that much in the, in the community. The question about universality in ion-based superconductors, what you can see here is um, the maximal gap, so it's a multi, this ion based superconductor has multiple pockets, multiple fermion surfaces, and the gaps are anisotropic, but you can always try to find out what is the maximal gap that you find in the superconductor. So There's a maximal gap at zero temperature plotted against TC. <clears throat> and you see that for a variety of systems, this falls onto a straight line with two delta over TC being about twice the value of TC. This suggests that there is somehow a universal mechanism for a variety of ion-based superconductors. And importantly, these various ion-based superconductors are very different in terms of their electronic structure. For example, there is this here, potassium ion selenide, uh, which is only electron pockets. Or there is this one, which has uh, electron and hole pockets, as in this RM1 to 2 um, series. And for example, if you extremely hold open it, you end up in a problem which has only whole pockets. So you have three different Fermi surface topologies, and all of them give you essentially the same two delta over TC. This is a, a motivation to look into a universal mechanism for superconductivity in the ion based superconductors. And importantly, I would like to mention that actually um, for S plus minus, which is, I think, the, the state which is. Um, uh, commonly believed to be uh, um, realized in the ion based superconductors, S plus minus uh, originally required to have central hole and outer electron pockets. 
and this might not be realized in all of these. Now the question is, what is universal in the ion-based superconductors? What do they all have in common? It's not the electronic structure. But what is the same everywhere is the local environment of the ion atom. So what you have is actually you have this tetrahedral environment around an ion atom. This is the ion atom. This leads to this crystal field splitting where you have uh, essentially two electrons in a T2G shell interaction. We're taking this as the main ingredient. We're taking strong Hund's interaction as, as, a, as an important ingredient and considerable spin orbit coupling, which is still larger than the T3 by a factor of four. And we're asking the question whether we can use TRDB here as a way to find a, a universal mechanism for connectivity. And ideally, even one which brings us to delta or delta. <coughs> so I think we have a universal mechanism, but we don't have 7.2, and that's actually part of, part of this. Still open for us to see whether TRVB can actually give this. Part. But let me explain at least how TRVB works in this multi orbit The idea is actually that the TRVB bonds are already stabilized on the atomic level on the given ion. So what you have here is a picture corresponding to the three orbitals, the three T2G orbitals on a given ion atom. Uh, so they are now represented as a triangle, and I'm putting two electrons in it. And by Hund's rule, you know that these two electrons have to point in the same direction. That's the same spin. Uh, and spin orbit coupling actually chooses, let's say you take dxz and dyz orbitals, it chooses to be mz equals zero state here. Which is exactly this triple valence bond state that I discussed at the beginning. Now it's just on a given atom inside that triangle. But of course, here I discussed just the, uh, I just placed these two electrons on dxz and dyz. In principle, I could place them, of course, also on the other bonds, the other links here. And uh, there is some degeneracy which actually allows you to um, resonate between at least two out of these three configurations at no energy cost. So there's already some resonating valence bonds on a given ion atom. Turns out that actually the spin orbit coupling chooses mz as a quantization axis in this direction, mx in this direction, and here ny. So that's uh, a minor aspect of not primary, primary important. Okay, <clears throat> so this is just a way of writing the local, the local uh, state on a given ion atom. It's just L equals one, S equals one, J equals zero. And the question is whether you can actually uh, liberate these TRVB three form pairs to create a superconductor which is macroscopically compared. The question is really can you make, first of all, uh, bonds which are inter site? <coughs> and then when you dope the system, after all, these are actually metals, even though not particularly good ones, um, what is the associated superconductor? And I was just going to summarize the main aspects of the superconductivity that you would get from this TRVB mechanism. So the first thing that I wanted to highlight is that actually this is a superconductor, of course, the theorists, but this is a superconductor which has a Cooper instability. And it's crucial importance that we actually have a non symorphic lattice structure uh, with a center of inversion, which is between the ion atoms. And as a consequence thereof, the gap is actually alternating from side to side. I need to explain why this is. On a given ion atom, I explained that you can get this preformed triplet bond. These are triplets. That means that they are, uh, they are symmetric in spin space. They're anti-symmetric in orbit space. When you have a band structure, the band structure of the, of the ion-based superconductors, it has strong inter-side, inter inter-orbital hopping. So it will actually, the, the Fermi surfaces have no degeneracy except for spin. So on the Fermi surface, the bonds that you have, so the, the, the Cooper pairs that you want to create on the Fermi surface, they also have to be odd in something. But our problem is that uh, we already made them spin. In spin, we made them actually, uh, this is spin symmetric in spin space. So how do we create this? Uh, uh, um, Odd, so what you actually want to have something like odd parity usually on the on the Fermi surface. And the, the standard way of getting that is through spin orbit coupling. If you have a P times sigma P cross sigma term, 
then the triplical mix on the Fermi surface into a singlet, and therefore you get a, a usually you can get a mixing out of triplet into a, a singlet uh, on the Fermi surface and get a Cooper incident. Here we don't need spin orbit coupling. The trick is actually that here we have uh, a center of inversion which is not on the side. And that actually allows for hopping terms yep, for uh, wave function components on the Fermi surface, which already give you uh, a, a support of this triplet bonds uh, if you project it to the Fermi surface. Yeah. Since they have support on the Fermi surface, you will get a coupling. Now it's important actually that uh, now this to get a to get a, a, a um, an overall wave function which has which suffices a Pauli principle you get to have you have to have delta uh, uh, alternating here because inversion symmetry actually is now mapping this side to this side and thereby gets, gets a minus sign under um, inversion despite the fact that it is even in spin space. Okay, so. So as a consequence of this Cooper instability, it follows that Cooper instability without spin orbit coupling, it follows that the on-site gap is alternating in space. So that's a physical prediction. <clears throat> if you actually project this state onto the Fermi surface, it's a triplet state, right? So it has actually a D vector. It turns out that the non-zero components of the D vector are dx and dy. Uh, and what you can see is that there are several uh, sign changes represented by blue and red on the Fermi surface. These sign changes lead actually to signatures both in quasi particle interference and also in, uh, in spin fluctuations, which are very similar to the signatures that you would get from an S plus minus state. <coughs> because ultimately these are um, probes which are just checking whether there are sign changes at a given Q vector effect in here. The gas structure is very anisotropic for this. Uh, triplet RBB induced state. Um, uh, and it has actually even some nodes which are uh, becoming quasi nodes if you include a little bit of spin orbit coupling. And finally, what you get from this is actually an anisotropic spin susceptibility, which is actually a prediction that would require to look into night shift data again for this. So what we have here is actually a, a local mechanism for superconductivity in the ion based method. Um, it is based on this preformed triplet pair. It includes, it checks several boxes of our original uh, requirements, in particular, it's stabilized by Hund's interactions. Um, it does not help us with this delta over TC being, delta over, two delta over TC being 7.2. Uh, and we still need to find a way to do that. And I want to just briefly show an outlook <clears throat> beyond this fermionic TRVB mechanism that we've looked so far. So our strategy, as a strategy reminder, what we have experimentally as an input is this universality into delta over TC. And we argue that this should lead to some local pairing. And uh, we discussed uh, triplet RBD, which is, as I mentioned, it's a local pairing mechanism that is stabilized by home interaction. There are other uh, approaches which are also leading to, um, these are more phenomenological, also in some way local, a uh, suggestion that a, in a Hund's metal, uh, the local the spin, the spin uh, susceptibility has a power law form, which is omega to the minus 1.2. And if you do a Liasberg theory with this here, so it's a phenomen purely phenomenological model, you actually end up with a two delta over TC being one point. So what we did recently is we went from this fermionic here with the discussion to a, a Schwinger boson approach to Hund's impurities. And I just wanted to flash very briefly that here, actually, when you dope the system slightly and you have such a Hund's impurities treated, treated with these Schwinger bosons, we do find quasi power laws which actually have a power which is very similar to this power here and could potentially lead to the ultimate uh, uh, universal ratio of two delta. Good. So this concludes the part on triplet RBB theory. Yes. So as I understand it, your superconductivity should be weak because it should be triplet by two. I know. So this is this was just for the first okay, for the so first I, part. I, I mean, the important bit here is that it is it is odd in this in this 
if you want to call this a unit cell, well, I mean, in the, in the non -democ, since there is a non demographic structure, you can actually take a unit cell as just one side. But let's take two sides as a unit cell, and it's all in this. That's the main point. It has to be all in something, and it's all in this two sides of the unit. And what I didn't quite understand is you motivated it by saying it doesn't matter what quantum data is made of quantum data. In this case, would you get similar behavior for all three? Yes, I think that this is. is that one of so, so uh, um, okay, we didn't do the calculation specifically for all of these different band structures that you get up on doping. But in principle, this is this Cooper symmetry, this Cooper instability is symmetry allowed in any of these cases. And that's the important uh, aspect that is really new when working. To try and coordinate my understanding of this with relation to, to continuum superconducting wave functions, is, is there a, um, a P wave superconducting wave function where if you project it on the lattice appropriately, you get um, your TRVD? So for the single part, yeah, it's just a, it's just a bit. So for this single orbital, which is a little bit easier than this non symmetric crystal mm -hmm. structure, it's just a you take a P wave, P plus IP superconductor, and you put it a projected. You end up with PR. So, so is there a weak coupling approach to the same physics that you're talking about? Uh, so you mean weak coupling for just for the superconductivity? I, or you, yes, with maybe bringing in the local physics through justification of that projection. Ah, I see. Yes, I would say so. Yes, I mean we're doing this in this field theoretical way with this uh, um, fractionalization approach, but in principle, yes. I'm a parameterist, I'm not directly understanding this. Uh, is the data preferred in your matricity or disaggregate? Uh, I didn't understand the question. Uh, I'm based on. I'm based on are you asking whether the matricity is of any importance? For yes. Yeah, sorry, no, it's not. You don't need, you don't need the matricity. Oh, um, so the matricity is for data. But does it compete? Is, is it, can we say that it competes? Would you say it competes? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, it doesn't have a good quick Okay, so. Let me switch to the second part and then make an, a connection. So, so far I spoke about a, um, an approach to triple superconductivity, which is based on entanglement. So somehow some spin liquid, which I started to then uh, liberate the parts. So I now do a second quick introduction into artificial emulators of quantum spin liquids, including triple quantum. And from there, discuss the second project or line of research um, on strong quantum fluctuations in triple superconductivity. So at first sight, this has nothing to do with what I spoke before, but you will see it has something to do with triple superconductivity and strong quantum fluctuations. What you see here is a Kitaib wire. This is a, a one-dimensional P-wave superconductor, which has uh, Majorana edge states called alpha and beta at the end. Uh, and what I'm doing now is I'm taking this wire to be sufficiently small that the uh, charging energy becomes important. It's still sufficiently large that these Majorana edge states don't overlap. This is called a Majorana Cooper pair box. So, as you remember, in the usual Cooper pair box, which is just a microscopic floating superconductor, uh, you have a charging energy, and as a function of the back gate that I didn't draw here, there are these parabola of states that you can have. Uh, and the, the parabola are usually just uh, characterized by a charge, which is an even multiple of E. Just to put it into order. Now you have these Majorana states here at left and right. So what you can also do is you can occupy, so you can make all these two Majoranas a single term. And you can occupy it, which allows you to have additional parabola, which are drawn red here, where you have an odd pairing. So this is the, the Majorana Cooper pair box. And what I would like to do now is I would like to actually take two of those here just to motivate how to get a spin liquid. <clears throat> um, I would like to take two of these wires and couple them 
by, uh, let's say, another, or couple them together just by Joseph's injunction, in such a way that the overall phase is the same on this and this wire. There's only one phase on this island. So this is one big island, only one phase which is fluctuating. And there are four Majoranas, or equivalently two complex things. And you can actually, let's say we are staying in this uh, parabola which is centered around zero. This is actually defining you a qubit because you can have an overall charge zero on this island in two different ways. One way is you put no electrons on the Majoranas uh, and uh, <coughs> zero electrons in total, so no extra Cooper pairs on, in, the Cooper, in the superconducting spectrum. And the other one is you take one less Cooper pair, but then occupy these guys. So, so there is a down state, which is there is no occupation of Majoranas, and the up state is you, uh, you, you occupy all the, so the, the fermions associated to these Majoranas and have one less Cooper pair on them. Say again, please. What do you mean by one less? Ah, I want to have an overall charge which is zero. If I, if I put two, if I put electrons, so I make out of this here, I'm not, I make some complex electrons, complex fermions, and I want to occupy them. So I have two electrons on the island, which are somehow in these red dots. So to have the same charge, I have to take one less group of pairs of the PPS so the, on, on the phase part of this. <coughs> and this creates a, a cube. You say you absorb two electrons, that makes the upstate. Exactly, the upstate is and the one where I have one and one. Exactly, I take one to prepare out of the bulk and put it on my run. And these are two different states. And this defines the qubit, and you can actually then define also the gates of this qubit uh, by just doing something with the run. This my run Cooper pair box can be used to build quantum spin liquid artificial. For example, if you put them in this array here, you create a topological Joseph's injunction array. And what you have is from island to, so first of all, each island has a charging energy. It's called DC here. You can hop from island to island, just a Cooper pair. This is just the usual Joseph's injunction. But there is also a hopping, which is not a charge 2E transfer, as Joseph's injunction, but it's a charge E transfer. At which point, however, you have to change the parity on these islands. So essentially, what you're doing is one island is in a charge zero, is in a zero parabola, and the one, the other one in a one parabola. And then you transfer charge E, which got, means that they've flipped, they've swapped their parity. Right? One of them is the other one. So the first one is then in, in the red, and the other one in the blue. What happens to the one zero, zero one state? Okay, so so this here is what happens if you're concentrating on the limit. So the charging energy is most important. Then you actually get a qubit on a given item. And in fact, I'm going to discuss this when a charging energy is most important, you get a you get sort of a mod insulator. So the one zeros and zero ones are charging energy you above that. The the one this one's oh one zero and zero one, yeah, that's their energy you above that. Sorry, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, okay, it just depends on how you how you put the gate, right? whether you want to have one electron in total of the ion, I mean, an odd parity or an even parity. So the important bit is that you have now three terms as compared to usual Joseph conjunction arrays. You have three terms which are competing. One of them is, so of course there's charging energy, there's Cooper pair tunneling, and there is single E tunneling. This is called EM here, and this, and I should say that this EM and this EM is not the same. Different authors use the same letter for different things. EM here means charge E to the synchronous effect. The charge E hopping from here to here. And when EM is zero, it's just an ordinary Joseph's conjunction array. It has a superconducting phase and it has something that is a mod insulator. But now, if you add to this the information that, ah, okay, so I put all of these islands into the zero state. And I remember that actually for each island, there is a qubit once I fixed the charge in a given island. You can ask the question, how do these qubits, which are living on each of these islands, with the effective spins interact with the charge? 
It turns out that by super exchange to fourth order, so there is some, some terms here that you get by just fourth order perturbation theory here, you get the toric code. So this directly maps to the toric code. In the limit, in this limit here, over here. And you get a toric code ground state, which re relates, of course, here to this. There is, a, there is a third phase here, which is the phase where this charge E tunneling is predominant. And it's actually what they call here an E superconductor. It just means that this is a this is a conductive state, and it has charge E at it, as compared to this one, which is a conductive or superconductive state, has charge two E. Okay. Would that would naively the amount of electric flux, uh, magnetic flux, and the flux has to be H over E rather than H over two E? Ah. So. Twice the amount of, uh, yeah, twice the amount of flux. You say that the flux, this superconductor, you have a different flux quantum than the Newton. Would you? I would have think, I would have thought of it. You've already thought about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. It depends on the situation, whether you get H over two E's binding together to get I see. Yeah. Isn't there a story about um, um, superconductivity kind of spin where the vortex is actually a skirming on and then the half spin on is a sort of mirror? Yeah, uh, it, it turns out that H over an H over two E, an H over E flux combined a bias on. I see. Thereby converting the sum of H over two E or something like that. I'm trying to remember the story and thereby defeat your hope that you see something. So if I do little parts of this, they would say potentially still look the same as that one should that or what's the experiment? Yeah, 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 that's the danger. These, these are discussions that occurred long, long ago in the context of spin liquids, and they're still raging today. And I wonder whether they're done or not. Can you talk a little bit for how we get to our closure? Yeah. What you were talking about yesterday, you know, honeycomb added energy coupling. Yeah. So the important information is you have the Z and X gates. So the Z gate is just measuring whether you have up or down state. And that's because essentially what you have here is you have the energy tells you that uh, so the product of alpha, beta, gamma, delta is one. That means that I alpha, beta is the same as I gamma, delta. So when I do I alpha, beta, I measure whether I'm in this state or in this state because it measures just, let's say, the first of these two energies. Mm -hmm. And that is just a sigma. But sigma x is the one which is flipping from here to here. And you can actually see how it does it. So you have uh, delta beta, let's say, or let's say this one, yeah? Delta beta, which is equivalent to this one, it is flipping the occupancy from here to here. So it does, if you just look at, at what it does in the, on the parity of the upper one, since it has only one Majorana from the upper one, it will flip the parity of the upper of these two runs. Means that it flips it from here. That's the sigma x. Okay, and now you look at what, what's happening if you do fourth order perturbation theory in this um, single charge hopping. Single charge hopping is the Majorana, which is whatever at the end of wherever you want to hop, times e to the i phi, mm -hmm. i one phi, not two phi, as compared to doing. And when you do this, you get actually, when you do this fourth order perturbation theory, such that you end up. So when you do one jump, you of course get into a virtual state, which is higher energy because you go, you know, you get you have to pay charging energy. But you can do it in a circular way, such that at the end you come back in the charge configuration that you had before. But as you do so, you get a product of all of these Majoranas around a given okay. And actually, what it gives you is something like z x. So x is always these two, and z is always these two. So it's going to be z x z x. So when you get this uh, around every product plaquette, zx, 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 sorry, zx, zx. This is equivalent to the Tory code. The Tory code is actually z, 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 and x, 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 and different type of plaquette, but you can redefine really it in a way that it's the same. So it's now zx, zx on every single plaquette. It's actually zx, zx on every single plaquette, but it's totally equivalent to it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we actually even uh, extended this to a couple of fermions to always set up. Um, to, 
to make this story that I alluded to in the end of yesterday's talk for your couple of permits. But what I would like to actually highlight is that, well, you could also start to study a simpler model, which is just a topological dosage consumption chain, which is just, uh, just one of these rods. And you have this hopping between here and here, and there's again EM, which is a single charge transfer, and EC, EJ, which is a full copper pair transfer. You get this phase diagram, which is actually not so different from this one. There's a charge 2E, okay, it's called Langer liquid in one dimension. There is a charge E Langer liquid. And there is a mod insulator here. And there are various uh, transitions. Uh, and actually, yesterday, Jamie Pierce and I discussed this phase diagram a bit. But there are some costless starless transitions in blue here and some easing transitions in pink. The important bit is that there are all of these different transitions. And what we're studying here really is the problem of Kitaev chains. This is the simply simple project of Kitaev chain. In, in this case, a granular version thereof. It's strong quantum fluctuation. You can also study this in a continuum model. This is actually, and this is already a spinless, this is a spinless, high problem is a spinless supercomputer. In some way also, just as an attempt at a spin polar, right? Which is P wave. So what we have here is a normal state Hamiltonian. And then we have here the pairing Hamiltonian. And it's P wave. In a one dimensional system, so psi dx psi. And it has uh, a phase, superconducting phase called e to the i2 phi. And what we're doing here is we let the space fluctuate. And we're just describing this by a two fluid model. So it's one, it's, this is the continuum version of this. And actually, it has a phase diagram which depends on whether the chemical potential is in. In the band, in the fermionic band, in which case you have topological state, and you have so-called weak pairing in the sense that the, well, the, the wave functions of the Cooper pair are um, uh, relatively extended, as compared to a situation when the chemical potential is outside the, the band, then actually you can just forget about that there was a band which could have ever turned topological. You're essentially just describing this larger liquid doesn't know anything about topology. Uh, and it's sort of a BC <coughs> limit. So you first form molecules which are super pairs and then condense them. So when the, when the stiffness is sufficiently high, you get actually superconducting phases, either of trivial or topological kind. And in between, there's actually a curious easing transition with emergent Lorentz symmetry in one point. But then you can have the situation here that you have vortices which are proliferating as the stiffness becomes lower, so final phase lift, you get into a mod insulating state, which somehow makes sense to here. Um, and here, actually, the situation is slightly different because the vortices that are allowed, the quantum phase lifts that are allowed, are special. So for this problem of phase fluctuations in the Kitaev chain with topology, it's important to keep in mind that phase lifts do something special in the topological case. And to see that, I'd like to first think about the problem of phase slip at a single weak junction. And you can even do it first uh, in, a, in a setup in a Gedanken experiment where this phase slip is not a, a spontaneous quantum phase slip, but just an experimentalist who ramps up the phase at two pi. When you do this for this topological system, there will be actually a, there will be this um, parity enforced symmetry, parity symmetry enforced crossing of Andreev bound states, which ultimately leads to the fact that what used to be the ground state with even parity after insertion of flux to pi is, this, is an excited state, and the ground state is now a state of odd parity. So inserting flux to pi, of course, is equivalent to doing nothing in the sense that the spectrum has to go back to itself. But the wave functions don't, and in particular, the many body wave function is now, after insertion of flux to pi, has changed the fermion. Now you can ask the question, instead of doing this as an experimentalist, just ramping up the, up the flux, you can ask the question, can I have spontaneous quantum phase lips which change you know, the flux to the phase difference by two pi? This would need uh, a phase slip which also connects uh, ground states in the fermionic sector with even an odd parity. So it requires a fermion from somewhere, and that's not possible. So, so phase slips with phase change of two pi are disallowed in this problem. 
And therefore, the leading phase slip that is actually condensing here, the vortices which are proliferating are four pi vortices. So it's important to keep in mind that the topology has implications on the many body physics. And here it was the situation of a spinless problem. And I would like to now return to the problem of triplet pairing and spinful variant of this problem. This is actually the, the project that I wanted to present in the last five to 10 minutes. This problem is a, a variant of this one, but it's for spinful fermions. So these psi's here are spinful number spinners. We have a normal state here, normal state Hamiltonian, which is just parabolic dispersion in one dimension. And we have a pairing, which is it's spin triplet. So first of all, it is P wave, so it has one derivative. And it has an order parameter field, which is e to the i theta. Theta is the name here. Sorry, there's a different notation in here. Theta is the name of is the variable used for the superconducting phase. And n is the orientation of the Cooper pair space. And similar to the way that uh, Charlie Kane and others did it for a spinless case, um, we do a we use a sort of a two-fluid approach. So we couple this, we let this order parameter field fluctuate. And it's characterized by its own bosonic action. It's a Lattinger liquid for the charge sector. And it is a sigma model in the spin sector. Each of them has their own stiffness. Or <coughs> this corresponds actually to a class D3 as compared to class D. And it's the same question. What happens beyond mean field to the topological one dimension? And here, actually, the phase diagram is not only known. Here, the phase diagram is not exactly known what happens here, for example. But in principle, the phases are known. Here, I think the question is much more complicated. And in particular, again, it's a question of what happens in the topological case when the chemical potential is in the band as compared to the situation when the chemical potential is out of the band. OK, so let me first summarize what would happen in the topological tri topologically trivial case, which is actually the same that would happen in a <coughs> 2 plus 0 dimensional statistical problem of the same uh, Bose-Einstein condensation, of, so spinner Bose-Einstein condensation. So in the topologically trivial case, you can actually think, OK, my bosons have an excitation gap. They're far away. I can forget about them. I just integrate them out. They won't do anything. Then I just have to analyze what happens to this bosonic action. Okay, so let's assume that we're still in a superconducting phase for the moment. Um, superconducting in the sense that Kc is sufficiently high that this guy here has no vortices to attach to it. Later. And now I'm sorry, I have actually here a, a notational um, clash. But um, the important bit is that the correlators of uh, the order parameter field is actually short range. And the reason it's short range that the order is that the order parameter is e to the i theta, and sorry, here I call it e to the i phi times n. And it fractionalizes into the charge and the spin part. But the spin part is short range because this is a signal model in one plus one dimension. And it flows towards strong coupling. It has a gap. Uh, and, and, and you're going to say that it might become gapless. This is what happens at the end. So, so this problem here is just delta is just e to the i phi times n. Delta dagger is e to the minus i phi times n. N is a real unit vector. But this correlator with this action is exponentially. Even though this guy is a power law, if there are what is he plus one power law. Perhaps no microscopic these even or all integer spins. Yes. OK, I will. Yes, I think you can have one phase. Yeah, so there, okay. Um, I wonder whether they should. Let me first tell the story and then I give an answer for you. So this looks as if there was no superconductivity. There are at least no optical long range order interruptions. But what you can do is actually you can study what happens with two. You create, you create uh, uh, two Cooper pairs here and annihilate two here. And you can make it in such a way that they form essentially a singlet. Just take the scalar product of delta transpose delta. N is a unit vector, it drops out, so just get a correlator of e to the i 2 theta or 2 pi, sorry, 
and easily minus two phi n is just a tomorrow. We have algebraic order of four E superconductivity in the topological trivial case. Then you can ask yourself the question, okay, so what happens with vortices? Turns out that actually even half quantum vortices are enough to disorder the system, but I won't go into details for that. The important information is that at best we have a four E superconductivity. And then below a certain strength of uh, the stiffness here, you get a disorder. Now, topological case. Okay, so here is uh, what, well, Pierre's already uh, guessed the answer. So when you integrate out the fermions, you have to be a bit careful. Uh, and what you actually get, and I'm explaining why also, you get a theta term for this uh, spin part of the, of the action. This theta term is at theta equals pi, which is the same that actually happens in a spot Hot half integer uh, spin chain. Let's say spin one half chain, antiferromagnetic spin one half chain. What you end up is with this, this Hamiltonian with a with a theta term. This theta term actually gives the very phase to topological space time configurations of the Cooper pair spin and leads ultimately to the fact that correlators of n are algebraic. As a consequence thereof, uh, the correlator of the Cooper pairs, uh, so the offset and long range order is algebraic here, and you do have a 2e superconductor. Actually, a little bit more subtle. Uh, you can also have gapless single fermion uh, excitations. Uh, and also, this again, another aspect that I uh, uh, alluded to before is that actually you have four pi vortices which are condensing in this case. This is because two pi vortices essentially in the charge sector are not allowed because of this fermion parity argument that we gave before. And you can have actually here, even when you have Kc so low that you don't have long range order in theta, you can actually create uh, these objects which are essentially pneumatic water parameter um, below the, the, the critical stiffness in the charge sector. But the important information is that when the charge sector is uh, as a Lattinger liquid, you actually do get a 2E superconductor. So when you integrate by the fermions, you don't get anything in the other? Also you don't get anything topological. What you do get, and I didn't really uh, discuss this, you do renormalize all of these terms. <clears throat> okay, so you don't get, for example, a sign term. Ah, no, you don't get any sign term. Okay. <clears throat> So how get, do you get this theta term? There are two ways that we did. One of them is through non abelian normalization, and I'm not going to discuss it. Another one is a more, uh, more an argumentation. So what this theta term does here, it actually gives, uh, to the position sum, it gives plus or minus sign uh, to the contributions with an even or odd number of skirmions in this n field. A skirmion actually can be decomposed into a meron and an antimeron. And a meron is something like a vortex outside the core and inside the core, it can either point up or down. That's the difference between a meron and an antimeron. But far away, it looks like a vortex. Vortex is the, the classical word for facelift in space time. Yeah? So it's a, a vortex in space time is a facelift in, uh, in real time. Okay, so this looks like a, like a facelift in spin space. And I explained before that actually there, are, there is this level crossing when you crank up, when you have a facelift. And this level crossing leads to um, really take it as a dynamical field configuration of the background photonic field. It leads to zero modes in the um, kernel here of the fermions. So there are these dynamical zero modes for a given field configuration, which has uh, a, a vortex and in particular, for the meron and antimeron, it looks as if it was a vortex in spin space. However, uh, inside the core, these zero modes that are trapped to this uh, space time uh, dynamical topological configuration, inside the core, the zero modes from spin up and spin down sector can hybridize, which ultimately leads to uh, when you integrate out all the fermions. Uh, what you have to do is you take the puffion of this kernel K here, and this puffion is proportional to the contribution of the two Majoranas that are trapped 
inside more Meron and anti Meron for up and down uh, case. And now hybridizing, so effectively, what you get is the contribution from this hybridized low energy quasi zero modes. Uh, and the function thereof is actually proportional to just e to the i pi half, which is nothing but measuring the Skirmi number of a Meron, which is half. So you can use these arguments, which actually were originally due to Affleck in the context of the spin chains, to argue that there must be such a, a, a theta chain. As I said, um, uh, you can also get it with the uh, ozonization. And Pierce asked the question where this here comes from, which looks as if there was a spin one half instead of a spin one Cooper pair. You can try to understand it on the level of a given Cooper pair box. Imagine you have a, a Majorana Cooper pair box, so a mesoscopic triplet system, which has fluctuating phase and Cooper, Cooper pair orientation. So the, the Hamiltonian, therefore, is in the spin sector, is just elsewhere. It's a rotor, it's a three dimensional rotor. And when you now take into account, the, okay, so maybe on the, and on the, in the charge sector, it's just D phi square, right? It's N square. As I explained, the Majoranas lead to this parabola in the charge space, not only allowing uh, parabolas with minima at 0, 2, 4, et cetera, but it allows us the intermediate parabola, which is the one that you get for usual uh, fermions, where you have uh, a charge which is odd, 1, 3, 5, et cetera. In the spin sector, something similar happens. Instead of having L squared, uh, after you integrate the fermions, you get something like L plus S. And S is the fermionic spin carried by Kramer's pair of Majoranas in this class D3. The class D3 has edge states, which are actually pairs of Majoranas, up down the Kramer's pairs of Majoranas. They can carry spin, and this is going to be added in the lower level. I wonder whether you've got some kind of statistics transmutation, like a binding of an electron to a pair to make half individual object, which then becomes. Uh -huh. It just feels like you must have pairs that are in the heart. We can discuss that yeah. much more later. Yeah. Okay, so this is actually concluding. This is concluding the talk. So I, I discussed two uh, research lines on strongly quantum fluctuating triplet supersystems. One of them are these triplet RB story, which on the one hand gives you some uh, non standard quantum spin liquids with triplet bonds. But then they can actually lead to a, a superconductor by, by triplet superconductors through entanglements, both in single orbital and multi orbital properties. The other problem where you have strong fluctuations, strong quantum fluctuations in a triplet superconductor is this one dimensional wire um, of, well, either the type <laughs> chain or the, the one that we studied as the type chain with additional spin degree of two. Uh, and here, importantly, that you can get because this. The band structure is topological, it has an implication on the many body physics, namely that you can have a 2E superconductor, despite the fact that without the topological band structure, there is only 4E superconductor. Okay, that's it. Thank you. So this is a one-dimensional system, and you do have edge space. Edge space. So, so the, this is really the so the Kajki type chain has spin less Majorana at the edge. This one is a triplet superconductor, which is spin full, mm -hmm. not spin polarized, and it has a, it has time reversal symmetry. So it has a Kramer's pair of Majorana at the edge. And as I try to uh, uh, argue for the answer. Here, so at least in the, in the single box, is giving you a, a, a change of um, the effective spin that is on a given ion. Yeah. Normally, on a, on, if you have a triplet superconductor and make it microscopic, you have a, a spin one object because Cooper pairs are spin ones, but now these Majoranas can allow you to have a spin one. This was very ambitious, but what about experiments? Where are you going to teach? Yeah. So, um, the 
<laughs> okay, so for the for the triplet superconductor, um, what we hope for, and we have some listicle for that, is that at least in quantum emulator, so then um, maybe for atomic. There for them actually, the one D is not so difficult. They can tune the interaction that they want. Maybe yes. In a solid state, I guess, I think it'd be more challenging. Okay. Yes, I heard recently there's an energy, a new ion based conductor. So this lime yes. silicon with hydrogen dust. Yes. It's very interesting to see if it actually lies. Oh, on this line. On this line is for the first part. Absolutely. Yeah, so my feeling for the first part is yes. Following along that, for the first part, what's your smoking gun for the um, what, what would be your smoking gun for the super conductors to be able to form through a pair of Yeah, so ideally, so what is really special about this thing is it doesn't smoke. Yeah. Yeah. Can you really see this? We we tried to think about this. For a while, but you can we try to measure the alternate alternating gap with some dissipants uh, experiments. Um, it's very challenging. We at least tried to come up on how to, how to do this. This is, I think, the most correct, the strongest characteristic. I wanted to make a connection with last week's talk uh -huh. because uh, because uh, Shema showed us those in the scanning okay. the uh, and using it to look ahead and to look ahead. We can't measure the same gap, but he says he's made. Proposal for it just needs time. Okay. So, in principle, you can. That would be then a testimony. You would need, of course, even two of those tips yeah, because so you want to have the tip go. Yeah, he's really, at least thought, about, he's really thought about it. Yeah, he's he's really said just accept the proposal when it comes to it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Perhaps a bit specific, but you mentioned the four H phase of yeah. uh, but where does it exactly hold that uh, phase in the first part of the presentation? Okay, so the, the first of all, this let's make very big for me. No, no, one T is the um uh on top, which is which is actually the quantum And there is another one is eight. Metal and becomes also superconducting by itself. And now, with this material is 43, it's to stack it. Okay, so what's known about it is that it's from USR, for example, it is the kind of symmetry. We didn't do exactly this. What we did is we just took a triangle lattice problem of this uh, paramagnetic, so close to this quantum uh, spin liquid state of paramagnetic form, and doped it. So if you think of this, uh, the structure where you have a metal quantum spin liquid, metal quantum spin liquid, you could just think that these metallic layers are just giving a bit of uh, you know, charge towards the quantum spin liquid, or, or at the same time, the quantum spin liquid is, uh, uh, you know, it, it gives its pre entangled uh, pairs to this, to this metal. Um, we didn't elaborate more on this, but it's a curiosity that actually um, out of this relatively uh, simple model, we have this. And they do see them as this is just I mean I, I tried to look for a, a decent model for the 4H phase yeah. that people take the one layer of one T and then work with that. And then they ah, discuss okay. possibilities. Yeah. Of what would happen if we consider the the, the full stack? Yes. I've never seen a proper discussion with a 4H B yeah. uh, model. Here's Any final questions or remarks? Yeah. I think they have a conference photograph. Yes, yeah, so that's the board up on the corner. Yeah, we'll get to that.